Hi everybody. So I like to chop wood. It's where I do my best thinking. And I got it all organized here. And it allows me to practice my OCD. In fact, I'm going to share something with you that nobody used to know. Look at how straight that line is of wood. And then if you look at it this way, each of the pieces. It's a matrix. It's a two-dimensional array. And there's hardwood, softwood, chopped wood, 2B split wood, 2B stacked wood, wood I just got from my surfing buddy from the tree in his front yard. And the problem is, according to Lizzie's mom, I can't lift more than a bottle of water for a while. And chopping this wood is a lot more than a bottle of water. So how do I have my fires? That's the problem. Hi everybody, so welcome to my first fireside chat. Um, I wanted to, and, and this is my answer to not being able to chop wood and lift wood and carry it in here. So I hope Mama Lizzie approves. Okay, so we're gonna have another Unity lesson here. Now we're gonna learn a little bit more about the overall IDE. So the first thing I want to do is review. So recall the last time we were together, we made a project and we called it first. And there's the folder and we put it on our desktop and we're going to be a little bit casual at the beginning here. Um, and then we'll get more formal by putting this into a a notes folder or something like that. But remember that you shouldn't copy and paste and pull apart folders. You should let Unity make them and manipulate them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go inside this folder and we're going to see that there's a subfolder, four of them, but one of them is called assets. And these are the things that are the building blocks for our game. And so they reside in the folder. They're like pictures. It could be blocks of code. They could be animations. Um, so, and they could be scenes. So uh, what we see here that has the same, we have two JPEGs, but we also have an icon that looks like the Unity icon, the thing you double click to start Unity. So this is, a, this is called a scene. And if you double click on this, it will open up the Unity application to that scene. In other words, it'll open up the project and then it'll go to this scene, which is what we did ended the last video on. If you remember, I put a bunch of objects in here and that's how we left it. So um, that's one way to start your, your project. The other way to do it and now I'm going to just close it up just so you can see. The other way to do it is to go to Unity, and there's that icon again. This is the Unity app. And if I double click on that, 
it will open up the top level view. And this is also where you can use, where you can make new projects or open old ones. And Unity is smart enough to know that you made this project and knows where it is. And so here's first again in another form. So this first is the same as that first. And if we double click on this, it'll do the same exact thing as what we did before when we opened up the project by double clicking on the scene. And the only reason the scene was in there was because the very last thing we did in the last video was we saved the scene. We went to file and said save scene as, and you can go back and look at that video if you're confused. So I wanna talk about the parts that you see here. And there's PowerPoints which walk through this too. So you can refer to, in fact, let's go look there for a second, just so we tie all this together. So if we go into the need out, ooh, I think we, didn't we copy our, I think, yeah. So your Unity curriculum should be on your desktop somewhere. And last time we, we spent most of our time in here, um, and what you should have done so far is you should have, and I probably didn't say this very well. So if you didn't do that, you should, what you should do is go find a JPEG. And there's one in the folder if you wanna use mine, but I bet it's a lot more fun if you use your own. So get a picture, doesn't matter what it is, turn it into an asset and then, um, load multiple copies of your asset into the scene. And that's what I did in the last um, in the last episode. So that was the lab. I don't think I said that. So if you didn't do that, you should pause the video now and go back and do that. Um, if you did do that, nice work. Um, and I want to bring a couple things to your attention. We're going to talk about um, different parts of the what you see when you look at the Unity application. So there's a lot going on here. And one thing I want to show you right at the beginning is if these windows get messed up, um, all you have to do is go over to, which one is it? Layout. And there's a button here called default, and that's the layout that's here. And I'm gonna teach it in the default mode. Once you figure out what's going on, if you wanna mix things up, that's fine with me. Um, but I'm gonna always teach to the default. So uh, what we've got here is what we were, was are left with last time. And, um, we have these assets, one, two, three, four, that got moved into the scene. And once they move into the scene, um, they're called game objects. And we can actually give them more uh, formal names. So like, I notice what happened when I highlighted Fred. This guy got little dots around it. This thing highlighted and something happened over here. And what this is, is this, this is called the inspector and it tells you all about that game object. If we click on this guy, it's called Fred One, and let's let's rename that to um, Sue, a boy named Sue. That's a Johnny Cash song, by the way, or Culture. And then, so now the the inspector over here tells us all about Sue. Uh, and then, if we click on Buffoon, then this guy here uh, is being told in the inspector. So whatever one is selected. And by selected, or this is a list of all your game objects. So as you can see now, there's four, one, two, three, four. And there's also a camera. So we're gonna talk more about the camera, but that's, um, we're basically making a movie. And if you click on the camera, you'll see, this is what the movie would look like if you were to publish it right now, which is pretty boring because nothing's moving. But that's what the camera sees. And it's a game object too. So when I highlight this, 
we can see over here it says main camera and this tells us all about the parameters of the camera and again if i click on fred then this inspector over here tells us all about the parameters of fred if i click on this one it tells us all about the parameters of sue um, and then we've got the buffoon here and um, i'm worried i have too many things so i'm going to delete buffoon and I'm going to delete the other buffoon. So all I did was select it and right click it and I'm going to delete. So now I just have two game objects and it feels a little bit more manageable. Um, you can see this white line over here. That's the parameter. That's the perimeter if, if, if you or field of view, if you will, for the camera. So if I'm inside this, these white lines, um, I'm going to show up on my output and that's what you see there for example um, if i took fred and move fred and now i'm going to start moving some things and i'm going to introduce different things up here so this guy up here allows us to move things if i hit this guy it allows me to to ooh, it, it move that moves the whole thing <laughs> that was a surprise um, if i click this guy I can move Fred around purely in the x-axis if I drag the arrow and purely in the y-axis. So a little trick, and this might be too much too fast, but if I take and I drag Fred over here so he's like halfway on that line, and then I go click on the camera, you can see if we were to publish this movie, um, Fred would be split in half, and that's because he's not completely in the field of the camera. So hopefully that makes some sense. So now I'm going to go back to Fred. Whoops, that was not supposed to happen. Sorry. Fred. Come back, Fred. There. Sorry. Um, so let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight uh, Fred again and bring him back to the party. Come on, Fred, drag there. Good. And then each of these guys, you can uh, manipulate, like this is a rotation. So we can rotate Fred and you can rotate Fred about two different axes, depending on which one you grab. So you can try that out. There we go. That's the other axes. So we're rotating Fred. He's getting seasick. Okay, good. And then um, we can also rotate about the Z axis. Whoops. Go Fred. Uh, now I have Fred is seasick now that I have rotated him in so many directions and I've actually lost track <laughs> wherever Fred is. So um, this is a good way to introduce the inspector. So if I want to get Fred back to normal before he throws up, um, we go over here and the transform is the position of the object. And this is the position in X, Y, and Z. And this is the rotation of X, Y, and Z. And this is the scale factor of X, Y, and Z. So we're going to talk about, so first thing, scale, just to get things all figured out. I'm going to, I'm going to make this one. In other words, I don't want to blow Fred up yet. Okay, so Fred's going to be one. Yay, and that looks, yay, Fred looks better. But you can see he's tilted a little bit. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to make the rotations of Fred zero also. So that's the rotation about the each axis. And I'll talk more about the axes there. Fred looks a little bit better. And now um, I'm gonna move Fred. So this is in, in the X axis. I'm gonna say like five, boom. And so Fred just moved five units over. Here's the origin. And you can see that this is the reference point of Fred. So there's one, two, three, four, 
five. Okay, that's why he's there. And then this is the Y. So you can see that uh, this is a little bit up from zero, but if we make Y zero, it's gonna go down to right there where this is the origin. And that's also where the camera is located. That's what that thing is right there. If we highlight the camera, there it is. That's that thing. So back to Fred, whatever's highlighted here, this panel over here tells you about the parameters. And so, um, again, big picture, our assets are down here. Um, this is where you're going to go find a JPEG and drop it in here. Once you drag the JPEG into the scene, which is what I did yesterday, and I'll do it again, it becomes a game object. And you can see there's another one, and it gets a new name, and you can rename it to be whatever you want. Um, so I'm going to name that George. Okay. And now, so assets over here, they're transformed into game objects when they're here. And what does a game object mean? It means Unity has done something to it. It's it's not just a JPEG anymore. Now it, it's it's got this like um, ability to uh, know where it is. Um, it shows up in your uh, inspector uh, and it can be used in your game. So the lab associated with this, so this would be, if you didn't do the first one, you should have done it and then turned the computer back on. Um, what I asked you do, to do is make a number of game objects that are located on the face of a clock. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. So if we go into the, sorry, I'm going fast. I, now I'm now going into the second folder and I'm going to, um, sorry, go into the second folder and I'm gonna open up the PowerPoint in there. And with Unity, what you're gonna find the labs uh, at the end of the PowerPoint. So this PowerPoint reviews or basically says all the stuff that I just talked about. And so if I went too fast, or maybe I was a little confusing, you can go look there. But here's your lab. So um, and I call this a sprite. It's it's also that's another name for it, but let, let's just call it a game object. Um, the your JPEG inside of your scene. Um, so you're gonna make 12 of them by just dragging it in each time, and you're gonna place your game, game object. You should get the size of it down so that you can. These guys don't run into each other, but I want you to place 12 game objects each at the faces, the number positions on a clock. And I give you those values and you don't have to write these on your on your output. You can just I just want to see 12 of your game objects located at these locations. And there's a couple ways to do that. And I want you to like figure that out. And the output for this is going to be uh, a screenshot. So now we're going to paste our output. And the way we're going to do that is uh, print the screen. And the print screen function is pressing the third button from the left. It has the little Windows uh, emblem on it. The thing that looks like this guy, I'm circling it in the lower left-hand corner. There's a key that looks like that. So you press that down at the same time as you press the PRTSCR button in the diagonally opposite corner next to the delete key. And then uh, you open up paint and you do that by saying P-A-I-N-T. And that's an app for Windows. Thank you, Bill Gates. And then once you open that, you just say Control V and you paste it and then I can see that. So that's just a picture of your screen. And then I'm gonna go and say File, Save As, JPEG. And so I'm gonna put it on my desktop 
wherever my desktop is. There it is. Click desktop. And I'll call this. Um, what am I doing? Print. Oh, clock. I'll call it clock. And then I'm going to say save. And so now I've got a JPEG somewhere on my screen. Let's go find it. It's like an Easter egg hunt. Where's my clock? Great. And I am wasting your time. Oh, there it is. So there's my clock. And when I open that up, there's my nice picture. It's a photograph. So what I want you to do, I will put out an Edmodo Blast. And I want you to send me that JPEG. And you'll be able to respond to the assignment. Um, and, and attach that picture. And uh, send me any, if you have any problems with any of this stuff, just send me an email and I will uh, get in touch with you. Hello, AP crowd. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the AP test. Um, so, and some of these things I'm repeating, but, but we got to, Make sure we're doing the right thing for everybody. So if you're not feeling it uh, and you signed up to take it, don't forget that you can withdraw at no uh, penalty. You get a complete refund. Uh, if, if that's the case for you, let me know. It's easy, but we got to do a couple steps and we need to do it sooner rather than later. So let me know on that one. Um, so I believe that there's going to be two free response questions. And anytime I talk about the test, it's, unless I say otherwise, it's my prediction. Um, but I think there's going to be two. And as I told you before, one's going to be like B-Day. And I think the other one's going to be like the free response question I gave you just before spring break, which I'm going to go over in this episode. So after I get done yapping here, I'll, I'll talk about the solution to that. Uh, my intention is to uh, send out practice free responses periodically to you through Edmodo. And they don't count. So, you know, like I would use them. My intention is for you to have practice. Those kids that are going to take the test, these are opportunities to practice to get you ready for, you know, the real thing. And I do think that where they cut off the topics, in other words, not including two-dimensional arrays, recursion, or inheritance, everything else. It's basically what we did all first semester. So I feel like you guys are very prepared. So the, just to get better, um, you know, it's, it's like doing practice quizzes. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then we'll go over them. And I connected with Vahe today. And hopefully he will provide, he'll be, he'll be the answer man and he'll make a video and I'll put that inside of the, the vlog episode. Um, I'm planning on using Discord. So I put that uh, poll out there and that's why. Um, it's new to me, but I think it's really cool. And I, the way I want to use it is it'll be a, a resource for people. Like when we're going to set up like a help a help place, help server, they call it. And, and I'm just getting the vocabulary down of what Discord is. But if you think of um, a server, which is Discord speak, as a house, um, then inside the house, there's different channels, and those are like rooms. So we're going to set up a house that's related to extra help. And inside there, we will likely have an AP channel. And so you can go inside there and you can either talk to people 
like you're on the phone, except it's going to have lots of people in there. Or you can text and you can text directly to a person or you can text to the whole group. And so it's a very easy way to uh, communicate and it's used for gaming, but um, we're going to use it to, uh, to communicate. So if you don't know anything about it, I encourage you Google it, download it, um, and friend me. So my name is Nito, hashtag 2736. And then if you do that, I will friend, uh, accept you as my friend and then we'll bring you in. And then I have people set up to, to help um, newbies. Uh, and I'm a newbie, so I'm not one of the helpers. I'm going to be there to, I'm helping with programming. I'm not helping, I'm not an expert in Discord. But please, I encourage you to do this. And I understand why it would be a little intimidating because if you have a question in computer science that you want to ask and then you have to like go learn a new way to like communicate, that's like a double hurdle. And um, I initially felt that way, but when I saw how easy it is, I think it's great. So uh, I encourage you to jump over that first hurdle and then when you do, I think you uh, won't regret it. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to go over a free response question. And it was a long time ago. So you took this as a quiz on the Friday before spring break. It was a single free response question. I was absent and uh, I graded them. But that was before we knew the world was going to go crazy. So um, this question, if you can remember it, would be another good free response question. I think you're going to have two. And this would be a good second one. I told you already that the first one, I think, would be like B-Day. That's, that's my leading uh, guess, if you will. Um, but I want to go over it. And I want to share some solutions with you. So um, to help you remember what it was, I'm going to show you a question. If you can read the first couple. Now, I, when I used this question, I swore that I wouldn't put it on the internet. So this is my, this is, this is uh, making me so I don't feel guilty. So there it is, just so you can remember it. And I'm going to do a little trick when this episode is published so that you can get a better memory of what it, it was. Wink, wink. So, and uh, if I forget to do that, uh, somebody email me and I will uh, respond. So what I'd like to do is go over uh, the solutions to this and it these, this dialogue is not going to make a lot of sense until you read the question again, which I'm going to figure out how to make it so you can. So you probably shouldn't listen to this until you have read the question through again and you remembered what was uh, asked. And it might be a good idea if you forgot it, to like do it again. Okay, so especially if you're going to take the AP test. If you don't remember it, try to do it again. Take a few minutes. It was a minimum day, so at most spend a half hour and then um, then look at the tape starting right now. So I'm going to show you one one solution, one student solution. And uh, the reason I picked this one was because number one, uh, it's almost right. <laughs> there is one error in it. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a little puzzle on that to figure out, see if you can figure out um, where the error is, um, but how do I zoom in? Shoot, I just figured this out. I want to zoom in on the top part of this so you can see. Yeah, sorry, I'm slow. Oh. So part A 
is right here. Now you can hit pause, okay? So you should do that. And this is sort of the standard solution to part A. I'm gonna, part A was the most interesting. So I'm gonna show you some other solutions to this. And this is about making a series to help, um, rack, uh, help you remember. Um, and then here's part B. And remember, you can, you can pause it and think about it. And then here is part C. And I'm being nice now. Part C actually has a, a little error in it. And the first one to tell me in Edmodo responding to this, um, making a comment on this uh, thread, uh, which I'll send out, uh, gets sugar. I don't know. I don't know how to get sugar to you. That I'll think about that. But uh, yeah, we'll figure out some reward. Okay, so those are the three parts. Um, what I'd like to do now is talk about part one. Okay, because there were some really entertaining solutions to this. And um, to help remember what, you should have read it by now so you, you know, but you the, this method is taking in, let's go to, let's go to Notepad++. So I typed in a few solutions to this and uh, let's look at the first one. Actually, I typed in a lot of them. Okay, so here's the first one. The one I showed you is a pretty standard um, approach, and it was close to you know the yeah the the way that most people did it. Um, but this method uh, takes in an integer, which is the first number in a number sequence. And there's rules about how the sequence is uh, evolves depending on whether the number is odd or even, and that's all written down in the question. And this method returns how many numbers there'll be in that sequence. So this person uh, made an array list and actually generated the sequence and then stored the elements in the sequence and then returned the length of that sequence, of that array list as the answer. And that's happening here on line 23, the return of the length. And this is actually the way I did it. Um, but when I started grading the quizzes, I realized that, and so more people than this person and myself realized that you didn't have to make the sequence. All you had to do was count how many elements there were in it. So I'm gonna show you, uh, and that's the, the one I showed you previously, this guy, um, that's what this person did. Okay, they, they didn't make the sequence. They just went through and store it. They just made each element of the sequence. And when they did, they, they put a counter in. And when they're done, they return the counter. So for entertainment purposes, there were a few people that used recursion to solve this. And I thought that was way cool. So here's one. This was probably the most, the tightest one. And this works, but that was really a nice application of this new trick that you just learned. And um, yeah, so plot for that solution. And remember, you can pause, study, think about. And then the third one I wanna show you is extra for experts. Okay, so this, I'm actually not well versed in what's going on here. But I typed it in and uh, this worked. And for those of you sitting at home bored, wanting to, you know, learn more, uh, chase this one down and look at how these shorthand commands work and, and try them out. Okay, so that is the, a little discussion about that problem. Uh, in the big picture, this question, you know, what about it? Uh, is nice relative to the AP test. Uh, number one, it's, its methods are static. So don't forget that static class like math, see, we did CV math. The only thing that matters are the individual methods. They don't have any relationship to each other. Uh, things come in through the parameter uh, list of the method and then things get returned. 
So there's no private variables. And that's why all these methods are, are static. Um, this method, this question is assessing whether you, whether you understand how to write a method, and that happens in part A and B. And in part C, um, you have to write a method, but you're also using methods that you already wrote. And so that format is really standard. They want to know that they want to know that you understand the difference between what a client is, in other words, what have calling a method like in the PSVM versus what the content of the method is and, and which is happening in parts A and B. And I think that's it. So I'm going to continue on with two-dimensional arrays because I believe that if you can work with 2D arrays, then you are an expert at 1D arrays. And that's being covered on the AP test. So I'm going to send you to folder uh, one in the NEATO textbook. And uh, I'm already there. Look at the path, NEATO textbook, projects, two-dimensional arrays, one pick 2D array. And then I opened up the PowerPoint. Getting fancy here. OK, so in the last uh, episode, I, I pointed this guy out to you. And I, this is the basics uh, definitions of how to manipulate two dimensional arrays. And I want to point out a couple things here. You can think of a 2D array either as an array of rows, and that's called row major order, and that's actually a real term. Or you can think about it as an array of columns. Somebody's trying to call me. Um, and this is what it looks like here. So most of what we work with, or we, I would say even 90% of the time, we, work, we think about things in row major order, which means when you access the element of the array, ah, President Trump. Shall we listen to this? Wow. Doesn't seem like he has enough to worry about without advertising. Ah. Bye. Um, okay. So uh, first, first uh, element is the row. The second one is the column when you have the square brackets. And I'll show you what I mean by that right here. Okay, so this picture shows you just as a for loop was best friends with a single dimensional array a two-dimensional, a nested for loop is best friends. Wait, maybe I said that wrong. Just like a single dimensional array works well with a for loop, a nested for loop is buddies with a two-dimensional array. That's what I meant to say. And here it's color coded. So you can see that the outer for loop in blue initially here there's a zero in there, which is referring to this row. And then this inner for loop with the red goes and it visits all these guys. And then the outer for loop row gets incremented. And then that means we'll go to the next row. And then this inner for loop zips through these guys. So this is how to look at it. And this lab has a few, whoops, few exercises to give you some practice with that. And these, these aren't real difficult, but I think they're really worth doing because in the real AP test, part of some, uh, one of the things that they expect you to know, like the back of your hand, is how to find the minimum of something or the maximum and, uh, and add things up. And so you're gonna do that here with the two-dimensional array. So it's, it's really good practice. So do these three labs. There is support code in a subfolder in this folder right here. 
and you can uh, use that as a launching point. Hey everybody, I couldn't sleep very well, obviously. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, the kind, the act of kindness for this episode. And uh, it was actually a contribution from a couple students, but uh, in the end, uh, Ravi, Ravi is contributing uh, our first uh, ep clip to an episode um, by a student. And I really want to do this more. So if, if there's something that you're doing and you want to share uh, with people, um, let me know. Here's my ghetto selfie. I don't even know if I'm in the field of view. Um, so anyway, he worked at the in the fall with uh, Daniel in period three, Daniel's in Buffet. And the two of them, Daniel lost his uh, files on his uh, laptop in the class. And so he taught Daniel about GitHub, which was great. And the product is partially what you're gonna hear um, that, that Ravi spontaneously um, during this new time um, decided that all of my students would benefit from. So here's his story. What's up guys, Ravi here from period three. I'm a senior in a super AP and I wanted to show you two quick things I added to Needle textbook to hopefully make your lives a little easier as we all work from home in this weird time. So first of all, if there's a change to the textbook, normally you have to go to Needle's website or the GitHub and download a whole new textbook, which can take a while, it can be a little tedious. So what I did is make this little update script. What this does is basically compare what's on your computer to what's on the GitHub and it'll only pull the changes. So from now on, all you have to do is click this update script and it'll pull in a few files instead of downloading the whole textbook when there's a change. Hopefully that saves you guys some time. Now the next thing I did was create this little CR script. So what this does is normally you would go compile and then run. You're all familiar with this um, and what it looks like. So what I did is combine these two into one file which looks like this. So if you're interested in how that works, I also put comments uh, for each line explaining what each does. So if you're interested, go check that out. All right, that's a better hour. So it's seven hours later on the same day and uh, I just wanted to make a few comments about the Ravi contribution. So I just looked at the clip I took at 4 a.m. this morning. Oh my goodness, I look and sound terrible. But I'll leave it in so you guys can laugh at me. Um, I just wanted to make a few points about what you just heard. Uh, first off, reiterate that uh, Ravi did this work with Daniel in period three, uh, Buffet Daniel. Uh, and they actually did this last fall and uh, Ravi brought it to my attention recently and uh, because I, he thought it would be helpful to you guys now and he's right. I mean the, the collective number of hours probably that my class, my students have spent waiting for Nito tech book, textbooks to download uh, every time I walk in the room and say get a new Nito textbook on a Monday or whatever, uh, it's huge. And so now all you have to do, you need to do what I talked about on an earlier uh, blog to get one copy of the textbook but once you have one copy then all you have to do is go to the file that he says and it will update only the things that changed so it, it's way faster than before um, so I'm, I'm really thankful uh, I hope that uh, his uh, reaching out here and making the the vlog contribution, which is the first one uh, from a student, will hopefully inspire other uh, kids to want to share things that they've figured out that they think will help other people. So 
Excellent job, Ravi and Daniel. Thank you.